welcome everyone and uh, we'll start out by going over one of my games I played right before the Olympiad last year in a tournament in LA uh, LA uh, Metro International Tournament and this game my opponent is international master David Proust and I'm playing with the white pieces here so okay d4 knight f6 c4 g6 just came, this came somewhat a surprise for me because I remember him playing some other openings so I didn't expect him to play the Grunfeld in this game so I played here, he played d5 so we have the Grunfeld defense here and many different ways you can play here and uh, for example there was a game today where Karyakin played f3 in this position against Giri and this is you know this move is actually getting more and more popular in particular Anand won a very quick game against Gelfand at the championship match last year so it's a very interesting move to analyze if you're looking for a, uh, the setup against the Grunfen and also this if you place bishop g7 you can play e4 and you play the same-ish same -ish setup so this is interesting I play this sometimes against the King's Indian also but in this game, after knight c3, he played d5, and I played bishop g5. This is my main uh, move against the Grunfeld, but I played uh, many different systems in this position. I've played c takes d5, the main lines, knight takes d5, e4, knight takes c3, pawn takes c3, bishop g7, knight f3, c5, and after rook b1, it's just... Uh, Lots of theory that you need to know here for white. It's a very interesting position, but uh, again, you have to spend a lot of time analyzing and going over the latest games and see what is the theory at this point. So, but I play bishop g5 because you don't, you know, you don't have to. You have to know the theory a little bit, but not too much. You basically can play this position by by the feel. So he plays knight e4. activating the knight and attacking bishop so you play bishop h4 here actually uh, knight takes e4 is kind of considered bad but a few years ago Morozevich tried this move against Carlson so it's it's not that bad at all actually and uh, I'm thinking maybe if I can analyze a little bit more dispositions maybe to try it one day so the way it works here after d takes it's very important for you to play queen d2 here first because if you play e3 after c5 there is this unpleasant check on a5 and you shouldn't allow black to exchange on d4 because if you allow him to exchange then after bishop g7 knight c6 is going to have very strong pressure on d4 so that's why you play queen d2 first in this position and this is how Morozevich played Carlson played bishop g7 e3 c5 d5 now now you can play this move because your queen is on the two controlling the a5 square he cannot check and also now you're protecting the pawn on b2 so this was a very interesting game i mean there is uh, further anal analysis needs to be done on this game but uh, looks like it's a playable position white probably doesn't have much advantage but uh, you can definitely play like this and this way you also you know a lot of the main lines you, you don't have to deal with Basically, knight comes to c3, and uh, so at some point, black played f5, and knight goes on c3, bishop e2. I think Morozevich ended up castling to the queen side, and it was a very interesting, sharp game. And then he played f3, and Carlson started to advancing the pawns on the queen side. So you can take a look at this game, and uh, you'll find it interesting. The game eventually ended in a draw. So this is another possibility here to take, but very important to remember after you take, you have to play queen d2 first. If you just play this move, for example, after c5 now, black has a very good game here. But I played bishop h4. Now he took. took. Now he plays bishop g7. Another move in this position is d takes c4. But now white plays e3. 
White wants to get the pawn back on c4 and try to have a strong center here. In the meantime, white, uh, black needs to try to play c5 here to put some pressure. So this is a different line. So normally, if he takes e3, bishop e6 played, knight f3, bishop g7. And now it's a very interesting move. I played rook b1 a couple of times in this position. Uh, had some good results with it. But very interesting move here is queen b1. From the first glance, it looks like a very strange move. But the idea behind this move is in the main lines with rook b1, let's say b6, when you go knight g5, he goes bishop d5 and e4, he always has this h6 move. And now you cannot move the knight because you will lose the pawn on e4. And if you take on d5, these positions are considered that white doesn't have much advantage here. Then he takes on d5. So the idea behind queen b1 here is that you attack the pawn on b7, and when he plays b6, you go knight g5. And now if he plays bishop d5, e4. There was a very nice game played between Moisenko and Navarra last year at the World Cup. So now when you play e4, Yes. Why not b5 check and then attack c4? In this b5 position? Check. Once you've got the queen in position on b1, oh. it's the check b, uh, b5 would attack c4. And after, but what if he plays c6? Now he's blocking the check and also now attacking on the queen. You back it up and still attack that c4. You've got the two pieces ready to go. Back, back, it, up he's got, he's got his back it up here. And then if he plays a5, <coughs> see, we lose a lot of time now with these checks. Now we have to move the queen again. And if we go here now, he can push again. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's not that good for us. So, so the but idea is you play knight g5. Now bishop d5, you play e4, and when he plays this move, h6, Moisenko actually went not knight f3, he went knight h3. An idea is if you go bishop e6 here, you can go knight f4 attacking the bishop. And eventually you get the pawn on c4 here. If you're going to get the pawn back and you still have the control of the center, white is clearly better here. But if you go back knight f3, then bishop e6, it's not so clear if you're actually getting the pawn back. I, I like these positions for white. Sometimes I even play these positions without even taking the pawn, just because I have the control of the center. But here, I don't have the d5 move because he has this bishop c3. But this kind of positions, you can just play positionally. Bishop e2, castle, rook d1, and you definitely have a compensation here. So this could be something for you to play if, you know, uh, against the Grunfeld defense. So queen b1, it's a very interesting move. There are a lot of games played. Um, with this move. But my opponent played bishop g7. I played e3. Now I played c5. Knight f3, knight c6. All this is theory. Takes, queen takes d5, bishop e2. Now he castled, I castle. Now in this position, after we both castle, what is white threatening here? If let's say he plays like a move like b6, for example, what is my threat here? It's not like I'm winning the game or anything, but I get a really nice position after this. How? c4. c4. Now he goes queen d7, for example. d5, right. Now you attack the knight. If he plays knight e5, you can simply exchange and bring the rook back on c1. In these positions are considered much better for white because then you have the potential of pushing f4, e4, and you have a very strong center. Basically, you have a knight on d5, uh, pawn on d5 versus the pawn on b6. So this is much better, and you can advance your center. We'll, 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 we'll discuss that. Your question is that? that? OK. That OK, we, yeah, I was going to discuss that next. So if bishop takes a1, 
You simply play queen takes a1 now and attacking the knight. So he needs to move the knight now. Question is where? If you put the knight on, probably you want to put the knight on a5 here. But now white has a very good compensation for the exchange because first of all his dark square bishop is gone, so his dark squares are very weak. And you have a very strong center. I would probably just continue with e5, e4. You have a strong center, e5, e6 ideas. You can also play bishop h6, bishop g5, bishop h6. If bishop a6, bishop a6 I would just play either queen c3 or rook c1. So this is a, it's not like you're winning the game immediately here, but you definitely have a very strong compensation and strong attacking chances here. So if you have an opportunity, you definitely want to go for a position like this. A lot of times the bishop on g7 in the Grunfeld, it's, it's worth more than the rook on a1. But there are also some lines where black can take, but not in this position here. Definitely white is better. Because position also close, so the rooks are not very effective here. He needs to open up lines, which is not so easy to do in this position. So that's, that's why in this position, black always takes on d4. So he, he took, I took, and there are two moves here for black. He can play e5, and after the exchange, rook fd1, knight takes e5. White is slightly better in this position because white has a better development. And if you take on f3, he will go bishop f3, slightly better. I think there was a game played between uh, Shirov, uh, uh, Rajab of Shirov a few years ago. And maybe, maybe he played knight d4 here. This is a better move in order to prevent the bishop from coming to e6. Because if you play rook ac1, he might play bishop e6 and equalize. But now you put the knight on d4, you stop bishop e6, and then you play rook ac1. It's a pleasant position for white to play here. And also, he constantly needs to watch out for the f4 move. What's the probability of a draw if it's pleasant? I mean, you say pleasant means slightly plus. Slightly but plus here. Like, it's like two to one favor to win. Yeah, I, I would probably, if let's say two equal players play, so maybe I think white will win 55% uh, of the time, something like that. Maybe a little bit more. It depends also, you know, which player prefers this kind of position more. Some players like to have the queens on. Some players r really like to go for the end game, early in the game. So, but my opponent didn't play e5. He played bishop f5. Now I want you to think here and try to see how you would continue in this position. So he just developed his piece, and still there are some games played in this position. So what can I do here? Rook to c1 is a possibility, but the, your pawn is hanging on a2. So, okay, well, let's take a look. It's not so simple here. So you want to push d5, right? Okay, bishop c4 first. Probably he will play queen a3 to protect on e7. And after d5, maybe just knight a5. Yeah, rook, you don't have rook a1 anymore because bish these bishops are very active now. So you have to be careful when you push d5. You may think you move the knight, but then suddenly this bishop is now very active. What if I play d5 immediately? Uh, if you play d5 immediately, um, let's see. There's also the possibility of just playing rook fd8, now pinning, and if you play bishop c4, just queen a5. This is another idea, but perhaps maybe you have queen b3 here. Yeah, you probably have queen b3 here, so just queen a3 here. Just to keep the queen, I think it's very well placed here because protecting only seven. 
and then I'm ready to move the knight on a5 or on b4. Also barricades the right queen, we have the eight. Yeah, also you cannot. Corral. Yeah. Yeah. In this position still? Yeah. Um, knight e5, I guess. Takes. Takes. Bishop e5. Bishop d7. Yeah, I have some some compensation here, but not so clear if it's enough because he's got two connected pass pawns so mm -hmm. and so it's not so clear so. no i didn't want to play rook c1 immediately because you know i didn't want to sacrifice a pawn yet mm -hmm. now what can you do here huh? Knight d2 is an idea. It's a pretty standard idea in this kind of positions. They move the knight in order, uh, white moves the knight in order to play bishop f3. Mm -hmm. I thought of that idea also, but I just wanted to kind of develop my major pieces at this point. Because I developed the minor pieces, I have some control of the center, but I really need to get my queen into the game and also develop my rooks. So you need to find a good square for the queen to go to here. You could go queen b3, but again, it's, not, it's, not really. not, it's a bit early, it's not so clear. Maybe we'll have a very slight plus in that position, but not so, you know, not so clear. Yeah. Queen Absolutely, queen a4. Activating the queen, connecting the rooks, and now I'm ready to play rook c1 here. My opponent played rook fc8. Queen a4? Yeah, I like this move. I like this move because queen is active and now I'm, I connected my rooks. Now you need to continue now. Question is which rook now you want to put on a c-file? Obviously that should be my next move here. I cannot put a rook on a b1 square because the bishop is guarding it. So I need to realize which rook now that I want to put on c1. Okay, why? Why do you think it's better to put a rook on that rook? Uh -huh. this rook, it cannot move Absolutely, cannot move, and also I can never push d5 because I always have to worry about my rook hanging. That's how you realize here that you want to put this piece here. Be because if you think, okay, I will put this rook here and later I'll maybe put this, you could think that way too, you know, because you know there is open file, you can uh, half open file, you can think about that, but you have to look concrete. You know, first you need to move this bishop, which is not so clear how you're going to move it from there in order to bring this piece. And a lot of the tactical lines, you have to now look for the e4, e5 move because in a lot of these lines, this rook is going to be hanging. So that's why you play rook f, rook a, c1. Now I'm threatening to play rook c5 and simply double up the rooks. So it seems like a simple position to play because both players are, you know, you know developing their piece, but it's not so easy for black. Because I have a concrete idea, I just want to go rook c5, rook fc1, and put pressure. If he tries to play b6, this is very bad for him. Why? Why this is bad for him? Bishop to a6, attacking the rook. If the rook moves, you take the knight. So he has to go rook c7. Bishop g3 putting pressure. If he moves the rook, you take the knight. Okay? So he cannot do anything now. I mean, he has to play e5, but he will be losing at least a pawn now. So it's not so easy to stop this idea. So now he played queen d6.
now. What the can bishop is hanging. The bishop is hanging in that spot. Bishop is hanging? The black bishop is hanging. No, it's protected by the pawn. Fantasizing about that one. So you need to think in this position because now I have a it's almost a forced line after which I'm gonna have a very pleasant end game. It's a line that leads to this end game which white is I think probably much better. How can I get to that end game with a advantage? Now rook c5 it's not that good because he can play b6. So he kind of made a preventing move. He dropped the queen and really defended only seven. And uh, Bishop, Bishop you could go bishop g3, but then he can probably go just queen d7. So he Bishop b5 is a possibility, but uh, if I take on c6, even if I give him a weak pawn, it's going to be very hard to win this position. Because, like, let's say we play a6. He doesn't have to play a6, but even if, let's say, he plays a6 now, bishop takes, rook takes. And now he wants to play c5. And I'm probably still slightly better after rook c1, but he has the pair of the bishops. So ev even if we get into an endgame where I win this pawn, but I end up with the bishop and knight, he has two bishops, he has excellent drawing chances because he can exchange dark square bishop for my knight and have opposite color bishop. So it's just he's get, he, he, he has lots of drawing chances here. So that's why I don't want to play bishop b5 immediately. And another idea, he might just go bishop d7. And then I cannot take on c6 because he'll take back with the bishop. It's a, it's a kind of concrete idea here. Not so easy to see, but if you think about it, you attack something. You try to weaken the position. That's what you're trying to do here. What can you attack to create some weaknesses? Think about it. B1. Oh, remember, remember the bishop, right? So this, uh, that's the reason I brought this rook here, not the other one, because I can never put the rook here. D5? Uh, and if he just takes? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's room, room, and then there's also bishop takes. Well, you, you probably get some tempos, but I don't think my king is very safe, so you're not going to be able to, you know, attack me because I'm just very safe here. So I probably just go, maybe even just queen e5. E file, but um, reorganize the pieces and attack E4. Oh, you want to play E4? No, not yet. We're gonna prepare it though. We're gonna make some blueprint moves, and then we'll go after E4. Well, the thing is, once you play E4, then you're gonna make these pieces very strong because they're gonna be now putting pressure on D4. So right now, a kind of his bishop is on this diagonal, but it's not very effective because of the pawn on E3 and D4. So I don't think I want to push E4 here anytime soon. So I want to try to attack and induce some weaknesses now. And I'm focusing on playing on the queen side right now. I'm not thinking about attack here because it's not practical. He's too strong. So I want to try to get some advantage on the queen side. Queen. I'm sorry? 92, it's possible move. But again, once you move this knight, you always have to watch out for the e5 move. 
because you know you weaken the control of that square. So he could possibly play e5. 93 is possible, but we have a correct suggestion here. Queen b5, Queen b5 yes. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Now, it's a simple move, but it gives uh, black lots of uh, headache now. I just simply want to take this pawn. And you'll be surprised. It's very difficult for him now to make a move. Well, isn't that like basically the same as queen b3? No, no, it's a big difference. First of all, queen b3 can, will run into knight a5 tempo. Uh, okay. So that's why queen f3. So this is a very strong move here. And now this move establishes the clear advantage for white. Let's take a look why. I'm attacking the pawn. Do you see any good way he can defend this pawn, first of all? Knight to d8, you also, there is also queen e8 ideas. So very dangerous. Queen can come to e8 and so knight d8 is not that good. So if you put something on b8 or c7, if he puts the rook here, what's going to happen? Do you see the move? Bishop g3 and he's going to have big problems here on this diagonal. So it looks like he doesn't have that many options. If he plays queen d7, why is he losing? He just played d5. He has to move the knight. He can't even go to a5. And basically, you just you win the pawn on e7 here. There are a few ways how you can do it. You can take on e5 first, then take, or you can exchange on d7 and still win the pawn. So you will win, win a pawn on e7 here. So that's why he didn't play that move. So now, and if he plays, okay, let's take a look at this idea. Now I played b6. So now he weakened the position. a6 square is weak, which is going to be very important. And then now knight on c6 also. It's not as well protected. How we can try to put some more pressure now? Double the rooks. Double the rooks is an idea. But let's try to gain some valuable tempo here. Don't rush. <laughs> Don't rush. You can play d5, but then he goes knight e5, perhaps. Bishop g3. Absolutely. Bishop g3 now attacking on the queen. Now he has to go back. Queen d7 only move, because if he goes to e6, he loses to d5. So now he goes queen d7. And now he wants to you know, maybe play knight a5 and get out of this pin. By the way. Do you see why he cannot play this move? Rook takes knight. Rook takes knight and then if he takes, check. we can take check or we can even take immediately. Yeah. Okay, so he played queen d7. Now, uh, by the way, there was a variation I wanted to show you. So let me just mention, if he would have played queen b4, that's why this was very strong for me, because now if I play this move, I have a strong idea here. Rook takes c6. And now he cannot take back his queen, he's hanging. And if he takes my queen, I go in between. Move. Rook takes c8, check. He takes back bishop b5, and I'm up a piece. So he played queen d7. Uh, sorry, he played b6. Bishop g3, queen d7. Now what do you do? Because you have to play very energetically here. If you give, you know, if you play slowly, he will bring the bishop on e4, and he will, you know, try to consolidate his position here. Very good. Now, I also control the e5 square. So he cannot bring the knight here. So he has to go to a5. I mean, knight d8 is probably another option for him, but the knight will be very passive here. So he went to a little bit more active square. Are you play, uh, queen, takes queen takes queen first, correct. Bishop takes queen. Aha, uh -huh. this is the whole point of inducing him to play a b6 because I get the bishop a6 in this position. And now I will get the control of the open file and I'm going to be able to activate my rook to the seventh rank. And after this, also bishop on a6 is an example where the bishop on a6, a6 simply dominates the knight on a5. 
And you can get this kind of positions a lot in Grunfeld, where black has two on one here, but the bishop on a6 is just simply dominating the knight. Because knight has no squares to go to. So now my opponent went king f8. He sees that I'm trying to go rook c7, so he wants to be prepared. So when I go rook c7, uh, like for example, if he would have played h6, then I go rook c7. Now if he moves the bishop, I will win the pawn on e7. And he cannot move the rook from a file because he loses the pawn on a7. So he doesn't have that many moves. It's just uh, after uh, forcing him b6, it's just now clearly better for white. But let's see now how you can improve this position to get to the winning position here. Of course, rook c7 is the most natural move, very tempting to play, but I don't want to rush. Rook c7 is not going to go anywhere. I can play this move next move, but I have a better move here. Something first. I could play knight e5, but... Uh, White is still much better after knight e5. It's, it's a fine move, but better. Something better here. It's white to play. OK, think, don't rush, think. <laughs> OK. I think now would be a perfect time to move h3, the pawn. What? Well, you could. I mean, no, even. I mean, just, just, just to have you out <laughs> route. Even after h3, white is still probably much better. But uh, <laughs> there is no danger of background checkmate. Be a good time. Yeah, but there is no danger of background checkmate right, right now. Not so. Right now, but it will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's. No, no knight d4. He takes, and you know you don't want to get double pawns here. E4. Absolutely, e4. Yeah. Consolidate, the Consolidate the center and ready to advance these pawns. Okay. That's what I would now. I'm ready to advance these pawns. Very good move. Now he plays h6, trying to control the g5 square. So when I go rook c7, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have the knight g5 idea. Okay. Now what do you do? Don't rush. Don't rush. Now you have a piece that you want to activate. Remember. After this move, I'll tell you why I played e4 first. OK, but knight is OK right now. Which piece you definitely want to activate? Rook to c7. Absolutely. See, the difference is if I play rook c7 here, it's probably still very good for me. But he has this bishop f5 move. Then he stops me from playing e4. And I really want to have the pawn on e4 because it protects my center, also restricts his light square bishop. That's why. So, and rook c7, he can't really prevent me. But he can prevent me from playing e4. Yeah, e4 so. is preparatory to the attack on the seventh uh, rank. It's Absolutely. It's a good move because now I place h6. Now we go rook c7. Now he plays king e8. My opponent is an international master, David Pruce. Okay. Yeah. Now, what do you do here? By the way, he wants to play king d8. And after he plays king d8, yes, you have a nice position. Everything is very nice for you, but you still need to find a way to break through. So I need to do something because after king d8, then yeah, my rook is very active, but I'm not winning any pawns. And then I won't be able to play even e5 because he will take my rook. Could you play bishop to e5? Normally in a position like this, you don't want to exchange too many pieces. Because his pieces, you know, I mean... But if you can exchange and have the knight uh, on the Yeah, side. but if you look at the position, which bishop you think is stronger here? My bishop on g3 or his bishop on g7? Your bishop. My bishop, right? It's more active. His, his bishop is really like 
open diagonal but not really doing anything. So my bishop is causing him more trouble and now if I exchange the bishops then he can go king d8 and then maybe try to move. And bishop e5 he might be able to play bishop f8. So. What about knight to e5? Knight to e5 is a move. I thought of it but what about bishop a4? I didn't see anything after bishop a4, anything concrete. He goes bishop a4 and I don't have anything Excellent, excellent suggestion. E5. You have that central pass and you want to put this pass into use by advancing, getting more control. And now if he goes king d8, which he did, what are you going to do? D6. D6, absolutely. Now you put the pawn on d6. Now strengthen the position of that rook. Now I'm ready to improve the position of the knight. And black doesn't have that many moves. So he played bishop f8. Now, in few more moves, basically, black is going to run out of moves. Knight Excellent. Now you bring the knight into the game, activating the knight. And you can see clearly that uh, white pieces are simply dominating. My rook is more active. All my pieces are more active than his. And also I have the center, my rook is on a 7th rank. Very difficult to find a move for him. Move that doesn't make the position even worse. So now he plays bishop c8, at least he's trying to get rid of my strong bishop on a6. Because do you see anything for black here? Do you see some good defensive moves, for example, he can do? I mean, really, the knight cannot move, rook cannot move, the light square bishop only can go to c8, which he did. So, do you see anybody, do you see any defensive moves for black here that he can really do? And, I mean, he can play, for example, e6, but that will be very bad because now my pawn is a protected pass pawn, and I will strengthen my center with f4, and now I'm threatening to go bishop h4. So, this is just winning. Yes, it looks like you could do this move, but after the take, the question is, what are you going to do next? Well, if you, if you then took with uh, the bishop, that would get rid of the protection on the rook. And take? I take oh, and I protect the, the bishop, bishop, yes. Okay, that's what I said. Yes. And now, by the way, one of my ideas here is just simply to come to b5 and win the pawn on a7. That's one of my ideas here. So basically, yeah, in this position, he doesn't really have many moves that he can play. So he played bishop c8. Yes? Uh, if you go b5 to win the pawn, would you capture with the knight or with the rook? Like, would you want to exchange rooks here? Uh, in this position? No, no way exchange rooks. Your no. Rook is active. This is passive. Well, let's see. Uh, in this position? Yeah, if you go to b5. Uh, let's say he makes a random move like something like this. OK. So we go knight. I, I'm not sh even sure if this, that's my best move. Bishop b5 might be even stronger, actually, here. For example, bishop b5 might be uh, stronger. But let's say I play knight b5, bishop b5, take, and he plays rook c8, yes? So now, why to play? What's the best move in this position? Check. 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 And mate. Yeah. Excellent. So he can't really do much. So he played he played bishop c eight. Now what do you do though? Again, if you play inaccurately here, if let's say you take on c eight, he's gonna take back with the rook. And he's back in the game. Because there is a background checkmate. You cannot take on a seven. Now you get a background checkmate. Now you see why my move. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. But I don't have to take the bishop, Preston. I don't have to take the bishop now. Because you know, my bishop is more active, my rook is more active. So I'm not gonna this will be a very bad move, actually. This will you would lose all your advantage if you play this move here. 
So what do you do now, huh? What? Excellent move, bishop b5. Now he lost control of this diagonal. He can't really move anything, so he played a6. Continue. D don't rush, think, yeah? I mean, when you're winning, you think. I think the bishop should go to c6. Possible. Possible. What else? What else I have here? There, uh, I believe most of the moves suggested are winning here, but you have something that is a little bit more precise, that doesn't allow any counterplay. It's very important in a winning position like this, you try to win without allowing any counterplay. Excellent. Even though the knight is on the side of the board, but it's kind of a good defender. So now we exchange this knight. Now we take with the bishop. Now rook has only one move, rook b8. Now you need to calculate. <coughs> What is the winning move here? Yeah, you still, you still want to suggest this takes c7, but he, if bishop takes, it's probably winning, probably winning. But you kind of, when you make a move like d takes c7, you kind of give him a little space now. You know, then he might be able to do something. You have to make sure you continue squeezing in this position. D7. Excellent, very good. D7 now. I sacrifice my rook, but his bishop is trapped. So he doesn't have any option, so he has to take, which he did. e6 check. Now this bishop comes into the game. And now if he takes, very important not to take the bishop because he just takes. And also very important not to take the rook because after bishop d7 actually black wins. Okay, so you simply queen and win immediately because you win the bishop and you win the rook. So this is the most precise way to win. There are many other ways to win, but this is stronger. So after I played e6, check, he went back, continue. Take the rook. Now his bishop is trapped, so he's losing a piece. So he played one more, few more moves. He took. Now I take his bishop. He took, and what's the best move here? After which my opponent resigned. I mean, mo mo most of the moves are winning, but the strongest move is absolutely. Bishop goes back to e5, and now basically he cannot move this bishop. He cannot move to g7. He cannot move on this diagonal. But his king is good. And his king, <laughs> his king is also, yeah, cannot go anywhere. So if he plays h6 now, h5, now I simply play h4, bishop h6, and f4, lock the bishop, and white just wins. So after I play bishop e5, my opponent resigned. And I like this game because um, it looked like in the opening it was just absolutely normal position. Both players developed their pieces, but suddenly I had this queen b5 move, after which, you know, black is experiencing many problems. And then I got a nice advantage after b6 and exchanging and getting the bishop on a6. So, this is a kind of a famous study. So, if you're familiar with this study, please raise your hand. White to play and win. I've seen this position in a few books. Your pawn is on b7 and you're trying to queen this pawn. Is white moving? Yeah. Force, knight, check, double check? No. Y y yes, but the thing is, <laughs> the problem the with. Computer won't let him do it. <laughs> 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 The problem, the problem is we're pinned. That's the whole problem. That's yes. The problem. <laughs> so that would have been very nice, but we can't. <laughs> so, no, nobody is familiar with this position. F1. F1 so, okay. Well, let's think first. 
Normally in this kind of studies you need to find really extraordinary ideas. Very rarely you would see like a check to be the solution, even like a natural check. And I can tell you why Queen F1 for example, because it's very hard to make progress. I'm just going to go back and forth. So you really have to find a deep move and the idea here to win. What about <coughs> Queen G6? <coughs> I mean, it pins. A, and if he and takes? You're, and you're able to queen, but then it's a rough end game. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You don't want to do that. You don't want to lose the winning position. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, and if he goes queen, king, b6? Check him again. Uh, well, from where? There are uh, many squares to check from. Which square? A7. Okay. A7. See, again, this uh, usually, uh, you know, it's not a check, check solution, usually, because we're not going to be making progress. I mean, you can check me again, but I go here. We're not making progress. So let's go back to the original position. So I, I don't want to give you a hint yet. I want you to find the first move. <coughs> Very good, but why? Why do you play queen before? That is excellent. That is excellent. Very good thinking. You put the queen on b4. Now king has no squares to go to. That means he has to move the queen, right? He cannot move the queen too many squares because he needs to make sure he keeps the pin. So he can go to these four squares. It's a very nice idea, queen b4. Now let's take a look at the queen d5 move. Can't win yet. So you need to find a nice idea in order to win here. Excuse me? Queen A4 check. Uh huh, Queen A4 check. Yeah. He has to go to B6. A7 check. Better. Oh, maybe A6 check. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's just kind of great. Think. Think about what can you try to do here. Again, if I give you a hint, you'll find it right away. <laughs> it's try to see if you can see an idea. Very good idea, yes. So queen b3 is the idea. Check. <laughs> Deflecting the queen from the diagonal, but first you have to force the king on a b file. Oh. So when he takes, yes. you promote the pawn into a queen Crap. and you skewer him. Perfect. Excellent idea. So, but you know, the only way you can get to this is you have to play queen b4 first move. If you just check, check me, you're not going to be able to get there. So now let's take a look at the next idea. If he goes queen f3. We're going to do one by one. I have a deja vu here. I know, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> same idea. Check. And it goes here. Same idea works because we deflect the queen and then remember we promote into a queen and win the queen. So, he has to play queen g2. Now, Very good. He has to go here. B2, same idea. Check. He has to take. But now we have a move like queen h1. Now, same idea, it's not going to work here. Because I'm planning to bring my king to c7. What do you do now? 
And this is a study, if you do it once, you're going to remember for a very long time this idea. The deflecting the queen idea. You could do that, but just go back. Mm. Queen c4, he just goes back to b6. King b5. Yeah, you'll be surprised. It's not so easy to promote this pawn because he is going to check and pin you. could do that, but again, king b5. Well, he can just go back, actually. So we have to do it again. Wait, queen where? Here? He can't push the pawn, you're pinned still. Oh, it's still yeah. So you can only sacrifice your queen if you deflect the queen from this diagonal. So let's take a look what's what's happening now if we just check, right? Check, check. Now if he goes here, you can win with the same method. Check and check. Same method works. But the problem we have that he goes here, right? So he doesn't get, he doesn't get. Uh, the Excellent. Now that's why you have to always look at the whole board. You can't just look, you know, this sacrifice. You have to look at the whole board to find the move queen h2 check. Works. Sacrificing the queen, he has to take it. And now, b8 queen, skewer wins the game. making an assumption that the people in this room can mate with a queen. No. <laughs> Ouch. Okay, well, <laughs> let's go back and do this again, okay? Because I want to make sure that you will remember this for a very long time, okay? This idea. So the most important thing you need to do here is you have to take away all the squares the king can go to. So first you play, which move? Queen b4. Queen b4. Now, these are the squares he can go to. So if he goes queen d5, queen f3, queen g2, the same idea works. You simply check from the a file and then go queen b2. So let's take a look again. If queen f3, check. And now, queen b3. If he goes queen g2, you do the same idea, but a little bit different. You have to go queen a3, queen b2 check, and queen. Excellent. So he has to go queen h1. Now, check. He goes back here. If he goes to a6, then you use the same idea, right? We used a couple of times already. Check, and queen b1. So, the hard move to see is queen h2, because we're kind of so focused on this idea, trying to do on the queen side, but you always have to look at the whole board. And now in this position, you play queen h2, deflecting the queen, takes b8 queen. On king c5, you play king h7? King c5 here? 
yeah, king c5, yes, you will just go king c7. And I think the only way to stop the, the promotion is to play queen h7. But then you simply play queen b6 check. If he goes king c4, you will move the king away to c6. And now he cannot do anything to stop b8 queen. He doesn't have any checks. And if you would have played this move, now you can actually even go back because he blocked this diagonal. So he cannot pin the pawn anymore. Um, so you will win the game. Also, you could win the game by playing king a6. And if he goes queen d3 check, you just exchange queens and queen the pawn. Okay? So it's very important to do studies. I recommend before also, and now again, just try to do some studies. If you can do even five studies per week, that would be great. Uh, just you know, try to get the book, or maybe from internet also. I, if you search chess studies, I'm sure you will find a lot of studies that you can print and just work on. <laughs>